live from Chicago, Illinois, it's theCUBE. Covering Veeam On 2018. Brought to you by Veeam. We're back in Chicago at Veeam On 2018. Hashtag Veeam On, my name is Dave Vellante. With my co-host Stu Miniman, you're watching theCUBE, our exclusive live coverage of Veeam On. We go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise. CUBE alum Dave Russell is here. He's the newly minted VP of Enterprise Strategy at Veeam. Dave, it's great to see you again. Thanks for coming back on. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. What a difference the year makes. Yeah, so newly minted. Last year we had you on as, as a Gartner analyst. Yeah. We've followed your work for years. I personally followed you for actually many decades going back to your, your IBM days. So, you know, let's start. H how'd you end up at Veeam? Unexpectedly, uh, very similar to IBM to Gartner transition. Wasn't looking to make a change. Uh, opportunity came literally out of the blue. So this transition was also equally out of the blue. Uh, some emails, phone calls started taking place over one weekend, on a, actually on a Sunday, so on, towards the end of a weekend. And you know, after a little bit of discussion, a couple of opportunities, and kind of looking at where I thought I might be the best fit, and realizing that I really didn't think I was in a position to relocate, you know, me and move the family. Even though uh, no one else said that I had to do that, I just felt like to do another position justice you really have to be there. And in the situation of the Veeam, I didn't think that was the case. I also think I thought I could you know, jump in there and they've got lots of other great people. I mean, Danny Allen is one of many examples. So I, I ultimately, from Sunday morning to, I guess, sad, the following Saturday evening, some things were sort of in flight and uh, they landed where they did. So, California, of course, as you know, doesn't have non-competes. People leave companies all the time. Uh, you, were in a, you were in a position at Gartner, you, you saw everything from everybody. You did the Magic Quadrants for, for years and years and years. You had you know, visibility on, on companies' plans and now you hear many of the folks uh, that were customers or people that you were advising are now competitors. How do you, as an, as an analyst and now a professional at Veeam, draw that line between what you can and cannot share? I don't want to make it sound too simple, but it's actually not that hard. And what I mean by that is, you know, it's not hard, I think, for anyone that does an analyst job well, a role to understand how to compartmentalize, right? You know, you can't go and talk to a three-letter company and then talk to a two-letter company and mix the two conversations. And the same, you know, with your transition jobs. And when I came from IBM for 15 plus years to Gartner, there's a lot of things I knew, of course, um, a lot of things that, I knew about even the backup space that I was focused on. I was the technical strategist for that product, development manager for that product. Uh, even in adjacent areas like storage, meaning storage arrays, you know, my colleagues, new colleagues at Gartner would say, I wonder what the roadmap is uh, for that. And like, well, you know, I, I know what the roadmap Keep is for wondering. that, but <laughs> you know, I'm not going to say anything, and no one asked me to. You know, yeah. it was never that kind of situation. And the same, I think, is true. You know, right now, is that no one's asked me. So, what do you know? Uh, in fact. I probably over-rotated in that I literally shredded everything that I had and took pictures of me shredding documents that I had. I literally took every drive that I have and overwrote it, not just deleted it, but overwrote it with multiple patterns and took pictures of that. Uh, Semi-ironically, uh, I guess I'll just give this example and but kind of leave it at a high level. For a couple of days, it looks like I was going to the West Coast. And so I shredded everything but their magic quadrant response. And then when I realized that wasn't the case, I shredded that magic quadrant response. So I had to reach out to Veeam and said, hey, you know the thing I just shredded? Your marketing plan that you gave me in person two weeks ago, the magic quadrant response that I had already printed off and highlighted and done notes on, you can you resend that to me again yeah. and I need to reread that? All right, it's okay, so now you clearly had a choice of places to go. You're, you're, you're sought after, you've had an impact on the roadmap and strategy of many, many of these companies. Why Veeam? Well, you know, I don't know if Veeam's going to love me saying this, but I thought there were two great opportunities, and I'm not kidding, I only looked at two. Um, there, there were a couple more, but I looked only seriously at two and for very different reasons. The reason that I really liked Veeam was that their problem set, or what I thought I could offer, was, was really different. It wasn't, hey, we need someone to really focus on strategy and to navigate through going through a, a financial you know, transaction or an IPO situation and what happens after that. 
It was more operational, it's more we already are in the enterprise, but we need to go big in the enterprise. We already have some strategy people, but we need enterprise strategy. So it was more of an augmentation play, and I thought that was really interesting. I thought where Veeam is in its life cycle was interesting, not that a younger startup isn't also equally as compelling, but when I looked at where I thought I could be of value and ultimately what was right for the family, it was, I thought, the best decision. Yeah. Dave, you, you've been covering backup for a long time, but would it be safe to say that it's one of the hottest times in this space that you've seen, and why is that? I'm a homer, right, so I'm going to say, I think I've been saying for 28 years, there's never been a time like this in backup, <laughs> but I, I actually think there's evidence to support that that's true. So let me give you a couple of cases, or examples, case in points. Um, Every year I ask the question, are you more or less willing to switch backup vendors is essentially the gist of it, and that was through my Gartner days. And there's kind of a scale, you know, are you somewhat more willing to augment the solution, are you far more willing to augment the solution, all the way to are you somewhat more willing to completely replace it, or far more willing to completely replace it. Long story short, the heat index, or I'm far more willing to completely re replace the solution is on the rise. And that kind of flies in the face of the myth that people don't switch backup solutions. The other thing I think was interesting is also drawing from my Gartner Heritage last December at a conference did on stage polling and you could ask people questions and one of them was one year from now, who do you think will be your strategic backup vendor? The top response is we won't have a strategic backup vendor. That was 23% of the audience. 22% said it would be Veeam. And then you went down the list for organizations or vendors that have far more market share than Veeam. So if the fact that majority of people say, you know, basically out with everybody, and then the second highest response is, we're going to choose number four in market based on market share, that's a pretty, I don't want to say, can we say damning? Is that okay to say sure. on here? Okay, that's a pretty damning indictment of the state of the industry. So, I know you don't see the stuff, or maybe you do, you do some of it, um, but, but the stuff that the Wikibon research guys do, and they've just, you know, done some work, and I want to run it by you and just sort of stink test it, if you will. Um, you know, clearly, we've been talking about all day that, that data protection is moving up in the minds of CXOs. I mean, yeah. that's kind of well known. But they discovered a dichotomy between the business and IT with respect to the degrees of automation. In other words, the business expects that there's far more automation than actually exists. And that's leading, in, in their uh, conclusion, to what you were saying before, is a lot of opportunities for customer churn. It seems to be a very churn ripe yeah. And, and environment. And then the other piece that I'd love your comment on is the Global 2000, generally, specifically really the Fortune 1000, is leaving billions of dollars on the table over let's say a three or four year period in either inadequate data protection or poorly architected data protection. Do some of those findings sort of jive with your experience and your knowledge of the marketplace? Yeah, they really do because the last three years at Gartner, one of the fun things I got to do was a little more horizontal was participate in CIO level research. And it was fun, there was like 4, 15 a.m. phone calls for me, but it was so fun to do because uh, there was, I think, 3,700 CIOs participated from around the world. And so if you look at the big takeaways from there, the short story is CIOs think that they're much further along on their journey than they actually are. I don't think it's because these men and women are blind, it's just they're thinking that we've been talking about this for so long, haven't we automated more? Aren't we more virtualized? Aren't we more into the cloud? And haven't we done more of our objectives that we set out to do? The sad reality is the case is often no. And if you look at you know, backup and recovery in particular, I totally agree with you. I mean, for the amount of money that's being spent in this industry, our rate of return is not so great. Right, it's not a spending problem. To your point, you're spending billions and billillions of dollars, you know, on software, and then you're spending even more billions on hardware, and you're obviously spending human capital to go and manage this stuff and professional services, what have you. So how come we can't restore the file? Right, and and essentially, many parts of that business are failing. So we can we can do better. Is your point? Yeah. I wanted to ask you about the value of data. One of your former colleagues at Gartner, Doug Laney, wrote a great book. Uh, I got an advanced copy, Doug's been on theCUBE many times, Infonomics is the name of the book, really talking about a methodology to understand the value of data. Do you feel like organizations, especially in this digital world, have a good understanding of the value of their data, and if, and if, and if not, how does that affect their data protection decisions? I'll give you the short, not so great answer, which is no, I don't think that they do. But to elaborate on that, I think someone or some people do, I don't think that's mm -hmm. distributed around the whole enterprise. So for example, 
if I'm the backup person, I think I know what I need to go and protect. You might be the Cassandra administrator and you say, no, this is the future of our business that I'm actually instantiating in this new application right here. Meanwhile, I'm not doing anything to protect that whatsoever. So if I'm operating under independent view that doesn't align with the business, then we're in trouble. And I'm fortunate, I think that's too typically the case that all parts of the business aren't interlocked. Mm. Yeah. Back to your point about some of the transitions happening in the market, uh, there's a number of players that are putting forth primary appliances, even though they are software-based, and, and Beam is 100% pure software. How do you see that dynamic playing in the market right now? Well, I. I I don't think there are any wrong answers. I know that sounds like a weasel cop-out, so let me you know, double click You're on no that. You're no longer an analyst, you can't say it depends. <laughs> there you go, yeah, there's 16 shades of gray, actually. <laughs> so, the, the part that I think is very positive on appliance delivery model is that solves initial deployment challenges, that solves proof of concept challenges. That's a wonderful thing to be able to say, Dave, I want you to go take this box and just try it, and then you say, you know what, I do like that, great, you can actually keep the car you just test drove, we can make, cut a PO for you right now. So there's actually a value in my mind for that hardware delivery model. Then you get other customers that they're on the other end of the spectrum, right? I don't want to spend more money on your server that you're going to charge me for when I actually have more buying power if I'm a large size organization, right? I can go to, you know, name your server company and buy it for cheaper than you can. And what I found is when I used to do a, a Gartner ask questions of what is your purchasing intention around backup and recovery? it literally became kind of right down the middle. Some people were moving away from appliances towards software based, some people were doing the opposite, and others were kind of of open mind somewhere in the middle. So at NetNet, -Net, I think anyone, whether you're a startup, like so let's just name names, Rubrik and Cohesity, they're today primarily a, a sales motion of a hardware appliance, but obviously they offer a virtual appliance as well. You take the other end of the spectrum, someone like Veeam, where Ratmir's made it very clear, we are not in the hardware business, and you look around and you see there are a lot of hardware partners. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, whether you own it or enable it, I'm not convinced is 100% uh, the point. I think it's really offering the choice, and, but more importantly, you know, what's the experience of that choice? People don't want to be integrators, so that favors appliances, you would think, but maybe people don't want to be integrators, and if they have a tightly coupled solution where they don't feel like they're assembling it, mm -hmm. but they also don't have to just you know, buy whatever Veeam says is going to be the controller this year, then maybe that's positive too. What's your point of view, and it may not be Veeam's sweet spot, but I, I, I wanted to get your, your thoughts on this. When you look at an Oracle environment, and you see how Oracle approaches data protection, obviously there's RMAN in there, but it seems like the database and the application take more responsibility for recovery in, in particular, and it seems to work quite well, but it's expensive, um, and it's probably overkill for, for most applications. I, do you see that as a trend, or is that a sort of an isolated tip of the pyramid? I would have said years ago that I thought it was a trend, mm -hmm. because the notion of either a hypervisor or an application you know, being more aware of recoverability or availability would make a lot of sense to me, mm -hmm. because you know, they understand more about what's going on in that particular system. Right. The reality is, um, and Oracle does a number of great things, RMAN is wonderful, ASM is wonderful, mm -hmm. they have a couple of different appliances, but I, I'll just leave it at the fact that that's not the predominant Oracle protection mechanism today, even for Fortune 500, means that there's some sort of feeling that maybe that's not answering all of the issues. Is that, you feel like that's an opportunity for Veeam then, but I infer from the I, I do, and, and to be honestly, to be fair, I think it's an opportunity for others besides Veeam, sure, but, but absolutely but I think it's an opportunity for Veeam because you know, Veeam is trying to go in and further penetrate that space. Oracle is forever going to be vitally important. You know, I, I, I don't think we're ever going to see a day where SAP running on Oracle on on-prem server goes to zero. Yeah, right, right. Dave, on the keynote stage this morning, you said you want to be a builder again. What do we expect to see from you for the next coming year? Well, yeah, I think the big thing is I have had the luxury of being able to listen to and advise people, and that's, a, that's kind of, I was going to say blessing, that sounds corny, but it's a, it's a privilege, but I miss the direct connect. You know, I want to be great to be able to really go to product groups and say, here's what I think we need to do in the next rev of the solution. Or, here's my rationale from talking to either Veeam customers or Veeam prospects about why they're not choosing us for some workloads. Maybe it's high-end work, Oracle. You know, and be able to affect change. 
you know, I, I really was serious on stage when I said, I view this as my last stop. You know, this is my third uh, switch, or third, second switch and third company. So hopefully I'm here for 10 or 12 years, otherwise that's a little premature of a switch. Well Dave, congratulations on, on the move and the new role at, at Veeam. Your, your reputation is impeccable and really appreciate you coming on theCUBE. Always good to see you guys, thanks for having me. All right, you're welcome. All right, keep it right there everybody. Stu and I will be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE, we're live from VeeamOn 2018 in Chicago. We'll be right back. <laughs>